Astronomy. So we're going to go over the basic terminology revolving around astronomy. Astronomy is basically the study of the universe, and we study the universe to learn more about the Earth, origin of the Earth and the solar system, for possibility of new energy sources. It's also good to know if, you know, some large meteor is coming our way and could kill us all. So on and so forth. Cosmology is the study of the origin, properties, processes, and evolution of the universe. So, digging into our cosmology topic, we're going to start off with the Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory is uh, the theory that most astronomers agree the universe began in one gigantic explosion roughly 14 billion years ago. So what they're saying is that uh, prior to the Big Bang Theory, that all matter and energy in space was contained into one tiny little spot. So we'll go like uh, there. And then one day it just went like boom! Bang! There, that's better. And it laid the foundations for our universe, which has now, and it constantly expands. Alright, so here's a little timeline for you. Big Bang Theory, 14 to 15 billion years ago. 10 billion years ago, we have our oldest stars. Our sun is about 5 billion years old. And then 4, you know, 4.6 billion years ago is when we had our Earth. And then 3.8 billion years ago is when we first got our oceans. The universe works out nicely. It's nice, neat, and organized for the most part. Okay, so... The Earth, Sun, other planets, asteroids, comets, all of that stuff makes up a solar system. All right, and then there are many solar systems included in a galaxy. Okay, so a galaxy is the collection of stars, dust, and gas, and it's all held together by this gravity, this gravitational force. All right, a couple different types of galaxies. We have our spiral galaxy which is what our Milky Way is made up of, and we are in the Milky Way galaxy, so this is what our galaxy looks like. Um, some other ones, we have an elliptical galaxy, we have, this is another spiral galaxy, but it's from a different viewpoint. We have a starburst, a dwarf, it's an irregular one, okay? So you see there's a bunch of different kinds. The important one, though, is the spiral, because that's the one that we're in. All right, so when talking about space, we don't usually use uh, miles and kilometers because space is humongous, so it would be these really big numbers. So uh, scientists created this astronomical unit to measure distance in our solar system, so it puts it on a, a nice scale for us. So an astronomical unit is the average distance from the Earth to the Sun. So we did that because, you know, we're on Earth, so it makes sense. So we're 1 AU from the Sun, or roughly 150 million kilometers. Okay, so another distance measurement in space is a light year. So a light year is the distance it takes light to travel one year. So again, it is a distance. All right, so when we're talking about space, uh, we are going to bring in the electromagnetic spectrum. It's going to come into play. So the electromagnetic spectrum includes all the wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. So remember, radiation, we're talking movement of energy through relative emptiness of space. So we have things like gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet rays, visible light, infrared, microwave, and radio waves. So the only ones that we can see are visible light. And the human eye, that is, can see is visible light. And if you, do you remember the, uh, the spectrum of visible light? It's that uh, Roy G. Biv, right? So here's our longest wavelength over on this side. And our shortest wavelength is over on this side. So it's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. All right, telescopes are just instruments that collect electromagnetic radiation from the sky and concentrate it so we can make better observations. 
All right, optical telescopes are ones that you can buy like in a store. Okay, they only collect visible light, so it's only what our human eye can actually see. And there's two types that we'll talk about, refracting and reflecting. A refracting telescope uses a set of lenses that bend light to gather and focus light, whereas a reflecting telescope uses a mirror to gather and focus light from distant objects. And the reflecting telescope was actually invented by this little cutie pie down here, Sir Isaac Newton. All right, so here, this one right here is our reflecting telescope, so you can kind of see it's gathering light, and oh look, reflecting it off a mirror, whereas the refracting telescope is gathering light through a lens, and it's kind of going through this focus point to your eye. All right, since we've been at it for a little while, we've got a bunch of different tools out there that we can use to explore space. Um, we've got a bunch of satellites. We have telescopes. We have this cool machine called a spectroscope that breaks light into individual colors, which is pretty cool. We have probes, which are packets of instruments that we kind of send out into space and then they just never come back, but they collect information for us. All right, we have rovers, like the Mars rover Curiosity. Those are unmanned, and they explore the planets. And then, of course, we have our space station, which is situated out in space to collect data about space. All right, so some pretty popular telescopes we have. The Hubble Space Telescope being the most popular. All right, it was launched into space to collect electromagnetic radiation from objects and here we have a picture of the Hubble Space Telescope it orbits our Earth okay so yes these are solar panels and then we actually uh, are launching another one here in the next year coming up 2014 the James Webb Space Telescope so this one is designed primarily to collect infrared light in some visible light so for those of you video gamers out there, I know you know what infrared means, right? So we're talking about heat. They're collecting heat information from other things out in space. All right, so motions that happen out in space. You guys should already know these terms, right? Rotation is just a movement of the body on its axis. So the Earth literally spinning, that's rotation. It causes us to experience night and day. All right, revolution is when we revolve around the sun. So this is revolution over here. We're revolving around the sun. And this causes us to experience our year. So another term very closely related to revolution is orbit. So the orbit is the path that the body follows as it travels around another. And as you can see down here in, our, in this picture, our orbit is not a perfect circle, but it is an ellipse. So it's almost like a circle that got squished down a little bit. All right, so a fact about our orbit here. We are not always the same distance from the sun. So sometimes we are close to the sun, and sometimes we are farther away from the sun. When a planet is closest to the sun, that means it's perihelion. Peri means around, helio means sun. Aphelion is when it's furthest away from the sun. And you can see we're closest in January, furthest in July. So interesting that uh, the hotter months were further away. So evidence for those Earth's movements that we just discussed are the constellations. So we know that we're rotating and revolving around the Earth because we can see these constellations at certain times of the year, and they're always present. So you know constellations are just kind of those connections of stars that form some kind of picture. So stemming from revolution, we have our year, and... Our year, or it takes us 365 and one quarter days to revolve around the sun, which uh, leads me into leap year. Why do we have a leap year? To account for the extra time. So if you think about it, we have a leap year every four years, because guess what? 
one fourth plus one fourth plus one fourth plus one fourth equals one whole extra day. So it takes into account that extra time that we're building up each year and it just adds it in every fourth year. Alright, time zones are determined by the sun's location. So because the sun is in different locations in different parts of the world, we have all sorts of different time zones so we can all be kind of synced together on some universal schedule. And the international dateline is the place where the date changes over. So it is located in the Pacific Ocean. I'll show you a better picture of it. Like on Friday, it's west of the line, and on Thursday, it's east of the line. All right, so here we have the international date line. And you should notice that, guess what? It's not a straight line. Now, why wouldn't it be a straight line? Guess what? It's not straight because we don't want to cut across any countries. That would make working and school schedules really, really weird. So you see here on the east side, we're one day ahead of the west side. Now, it may throw you off since uh, if you were drawing out a compass, you would say, wait, north, east, south, west, this is the east side, but it's not. Remember, we're in the western hemisphere. This is the eastern hemisphere, so that's why. Daylight savings time also has to do with space and our earth. So daylight savings time is caused by the tilt of the earth. Because of the way we're tilted, the sun rises earlier in the summer months. So to take advantage of this daylight and save energy, our clocks are set forward. So since we have less and less daylight in the wintertime, our clocks are set backwards for the same reasons. Woohoo! Seasons! We got all four here in Virginia because we're pretty lucky. But the seasons are also caused by the tilt of the earth, which is 23 and a half degrees. And they're caused by the revolution of the Earth. So when you're receiving more direct sunlight, that region is warmer. That'll give you summertime. Uh, you know, when you're receiving less direct, sun less direct sunlight, then that's going to be colder and you're going to get wintertime. And it's important to know that the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere are completely opposite each other. Sticking with the seasons, of the four seasons, uh, you can relate two of them to an equinox. An equinox, equa, the prefix equa, means equal, nox means night. So we have equal hours of daytime and nighttime. And the two times this occurs every year is the spring or vernal equinox, which is around March 21st or 22nd. And the sun's rays will directly strike at the equator. This marks the first day of spring and like I said equal hours of daylight, equal hours of darkness all over the earth. Alright, the fall or the autumnal equinox is usually around September 22nd or 23rd. Again, the rays are directly striking at the equator. First day of fall, equal hours of daylight, equal hours of darkness all over. So here is your equinox, equinox picture. We have our sun's rays directly striking the equator. And you notice, hey, look, it's equal. We have equal hours of daylight and nighttime all over. All right, the other two seasons are referred to with a solstice. So the winter solstice is where the northern hemisphere for us points away from the sun. So you see how we're pointed in the opposite direction of the sun. So we're receiving less direct sunlight. It's going to be colder. In this case, the direct rays of the sun will strike the Tropic of Capricorn, which is 23.5 degrees south latitude. All right, this marks the first day of winter. It's usually December 21st or 22nd. So the other solstice is the summer solstice, which is where we have our northern hemisphere pointing towards the sun. Okay, so we're getting more direct sunlight, so it's going to be warmer. So at the summer solstice, we have the, the rays directly striking at the Tropic of Can Cancer, which guess what? 23.5 degrees north latitude. 
This marks the first day of summer, which is June 21st or 22nd. And guess what? There's also the longest hours of daylight here. Longest hours of daylight for a summer solstice, shorter hours of daylight for the winter solstice. Here is a cool animation to show you the reason for the seasons. We begin with Earth's spin axis oriented at a right angle to the Earth's orbit plane around the sun. If this were true, day and night would always be equally long and we would not have seasons. We zoom in to see the real tilt of Earth's spin axis, which is 23.5 degrees from perpendicular to the Earth-Sun plane. This tilt is what gives us seasons. To better see why, let's view the Earth-Sun plane from a different perspective. We begin with the summer solstice, when Earth's north pole is tilted toward the sun. Zooming in on our planet, we see that sunlight strikes the northern hemisphere more directly, making the day length there longer. This is day length longer, striking the Tropic of Cancer. This is the longest day in the northern hemisphere's summer. Longest day. In the After year. Earth moves along its orbit over the next three months, we reach the autumnal equinox a date when day and night length is the same. This is because Earth's spin axis is not pointed either toward or away from the Sun. This is shown in the side view where the sunlight strikes the equator directly and the poles equally. Around December 21st we reach the winter solstice. At this time the South Pole is tilted toward the Sun. We'll point it away. Sunlight strikes the Southern Hemisphere more directly making this their summer season. This corresponds to the shortest day in the Northern Hemisphere's winter. Three months later we reach the vernal equinox, the other date during the year when day and night length are equal. We complete our year-long circuit around the Sun with the begin of another season. Cool, it just went around an orbit or a revolution. Neato. And if you noticed, it rotated the entire time it revolved. That's how it actually happens.